Hi, so I've had another request to review um, arguably one of the hardest topics, I think, in the, um, in the IB Psychology course, um, biology, cognition, and emotion. This is a pretty tricky one, um, so bear with me. Now, a reminder, this is for May, November 2018, the old syllabus where we have this learning outcome. To what extent do cognitive, cognitive and biological factors interact in emotion? Uh, the topics I'm going to explain in this video um, are relevant to the new syllabus, but not in the way I'm going to uh, explain them. So we're going to look at, basically our key question here is, uh, we have to explain emotion. Where does emotion come from? This is what the question is looking at, and it's directing you to explain that emotion is affected by cognition and biology. So you have to be able to explain how both of those things are going to influence emotion. And the two examples I'm going to explain in this video, the first one is bottom-up processing. Uh, this is the amygdala, so this is looking at how the biological factors can affect emotion and how the cogn uh, cognition can affect emotion. We're going to look at cognitive uh, reappraisal. So they are the two factors we're going to focus on. All right, so let's start with the biology and emotion because this is, I think, the, the easier one uh, to get. We're going to look at the amygdala. An activity in the amygdala is going to produce an emotion, for example, fear. Um, <clears throat> so bottom-up processing works this way. Uh, I, I went for a run the other day, last week. True story. And I was running on the path. It was about 8 o'clock in the morning. And there was this big snake. It was about a meter long. I hate snakes. I saw it. It was lying across the path. And before I could really do anything, I just felt this jolt of adrenaline straight to the heart. And I jumped, like, really high in the air. And I leapt over the snake and kept running. And then as I was kept jogging, I was like, uh, so oh, as I kept running, my heart was racing. I was thinking, oh, man, that was freaky. What was happening there is, is bottom-up processing. My amygdala received a message from my visual cortex, so uh, before my, the thinking part of my brain even knew I'd seen a snake. Uh, and that's how the amygdala works, because I, I need to react quickly, right? I don't have time to go, oh, snake, all right, what shall I do? I should jump too slow, right? Um, uh, so we've evolved this this quick response. My, my eyes saw the snake, recognize it, sent the message to my amygdala, bang, uh, activated the hypothalamus, HPA access, adrenaline starts pumping. Oh, and then I'm thinking, man, wow, that was freaky. That was pretty scary. And that's bottom-up processing. So from the environment, the stimulus hits the amygdala, produces the emotion. And, and so how do we know this? So really early studies on monkeys, this started in the late 1800s, um, and then one uh, in the 1950s, Weinskrantz. What they would do is they would take monkeys and they would put them in different conditions. In one condition, they would damage or lesion the amygdala. And in the other condition, they would damage different parts of the temporal lobe. And in others, they wouldn't do any damage as a control. And what they found, and so then they would look at the changes in behavior. And they'd find that damaging the amygdala like this would result in emotional blunting. The monkeys would be tamed. Uh, they would no longer fear the researchers. There was a whole bunch of other side effects as well. But one of the, the, the effects was that yeah, they, they displayed this lack of emotion. And this was one of the first uh, examples of, um, you know, uh, early studies that suggest that the amygdala is integral in emotion. And a more recent study, it's really interesting, is um, SM. And you might have covered this in your course. So SM has a rare genetic condition, um, which means she has damage to both her amygdala. We have one on each side. And it's only damage in the amygdala. And this is why she's really valuable to study. It's really easy to find people that have damage to the outer cortex of their brain because it's, you know, it's at our outer, it's, it's more exposed, it's easier to damage. But to find people that have localized damage within the deep parts of their brain, really rare. So SM is a very valuable case study. Uh, and, and previous studies before this one showed she uh, had a reduction in fear conditioning, which means she struggles to learn to be afraid of things. Um, right, and that's really dangerous for her. And also in recognizing fear, so in being able to see someone else's fearful expression. But the aim of this case study was to see, could she experience fear herself? And they had a fair bit of evidence to su suggest that she didn't, but they wanted to run some tests. So they did three things. They took her to a pet store, haunted house, and they showed her clips of scary films. So we're just going to look at two of these. Um, they took her to a pet store, and she told them, you know, I don't like snakes, I don't like spiders, I try to avoid them, they're pretty gross. They took them to an exotic pet store that had big snakes, reptiles, um, spiders, and they, you know, had their clipboards taking notes, observing her behavior. Uh, so even though she said that she didn't like snakes and spiders, she didn't show any signs of fear. She didn't look like she didn't like them, um, she didn't try to avoid them. In fact, she kept asking, like, hey, can we go back there? What are those 
big ones and she was touching them and she looked really intrigued and curious and she's like you know this is really cool um so she didn't display any fear of these things that she said she was scared of uh, another one they took her to a haunted house um once a year this this old psychiatric hospital would be decorated with um you know monsters and trying to scare people for halloween so they took sm and they got five other um, female participants as well and they walked around this haunted house and again they, they observed her behavior um what they found was again no fear sm did not display uh, any fear at all and in fact there's a couple of anecdotes where they say um, she actually scared one of the monsters I think she came around a corner or something and they weren't expecting it and they were a little bit taken aback and again she was like quite curious and intrigued um, <clears throat> yeah so she she wasn't scared and and actually in the self-report data like this has got her in a lot of trouble in her life um, she lives in a pretty dangerous neighborhood I think from the report they said and you know she continues to take sort of dangerous ways home um she's been in abusive relationships i think she's been held up at gun uh, knife point i think it was once or twice so you know this lack of of feeling fear is is pretty dangerous and we can see why we've evolved that the amygdala's role in this to, to generate fear so we can um learn uh you know to avoid dangerous situations so what we're looking at here is the conclusions from that study is the amygdala, the biological factor, is really important in experiencing emotion, in this case the specific emotion of fear. But how we think can also affect emotion. And so this is where we have to look at um, the role of cognition. Right? It's not just a matter of, you know, sea snake, amygdala, bang, fear. That happens, that's bottom-up processing, but we also have top-down generation of emotion. And I'm going to explain this by... Um, looking at this picture and take a look at this picture right do you get any sort of emotional response from this right? what if I said that you know the little girl there she's taking a nap you probably think okay alright it's pretty sweet the truth though with this is this kid is is dying of starvation right this is uh, taken this is in a Jewish ghetto in the 1945 uh, in the Holocaust and um, she hasn't had any food now uh, I'm a father and you can um, Probably see when I when I think about this picture, it it gets to me. I well up. I, I feel I, I feel more emotional than I did thirty seconds ago before I started thinking about this. And why is because I think about my son and if my son was in a situation and, and a, a girl died. This is top down generation. My feelings of emotion right now by looking at this picture, which gets me every time, which is why I chose it, uh, is my thinking. My thought processes are affecting my amygdala. And that is producing this this emotional response in me. So it's not only from the environment up um, unconsciously, but also the way we consciously think can affect our emotional output. So this is top-down processing, right? And if we go back to my snake example, maybe a couple of days later, you know, I, I, I don't like snakes. I'm f super freaked out about them. So I might be thinking, oh, man, that was so scary. And th if I think about it, oh, geez, it was torturous. That's going to increase the activity in my amygdala, and that's going to produce the emotion. So, so this is where the cognition is um, influencing our, our feeling of emotion. Now, how we know this, one, one um, piece of evidence for this is um, a study in 2006. They looked at the connection of cognitive reappraisal and the amygdala. So just so you know, cognitive reappraisal means you see a stimuli, you see something, and you think differently about it. Right, it's the, it's the way that you reappraise. So you're you're seeing it, and then you're you're thinking consciously about that stimuli in some way. So they wanted to see how this how this way of thinking about stimuli can affect the activity in the amygdala. So um, they used an fMRI, 19 participants, and they in the fMRI they showed them a range of different photos. Some were were you know happy, like you know I don't know kids playing. Some of them might have been um, like a bit vicious, scary, like I don't know like a snake lunging at you or a dog fight, and some of them were just neutral, like a picture of a bus. Um, <clears throat> so they showed them these pictures and they asked them to cognitive reappraise the stimuli and they had three different ways that they did this. One was to increase and this was trying to you know, increase the emotional effect of it, decrease the emotional effect or just attend. And just to give you an example, to increase one of the things, they, they had to train them how to cognitive reappraise stimuli. One of the things they asked the participants to do for the increase would be imagine that, that scene happening to someone you love or imagine that scene escalating and getting worse. So, you know, they're, they're consciously thinking about the stimuli and, and trying to make it more emotional. So, for example, if it was a car crash, you know, they just show a picture of a car crash, if they're in the increased condition, it would be um, maybe they're picturing someone that they loved was in that car crash and, and injured. So, in the decreased condition, same example of maybe it was a car crash, they, one of the ways that they would cognitively appraise was imagine it having a happy outcome. 
right? So it could have been, you know, everyone walked away and, and they were fine, right? So it's taking that and, and making it seem less. And then the attend was just they focus on the image and notice the details, not really thinking about any emotional aspect of it. Okay, so the results, what did they find? They found that in the increased condition, when the cognitive reappraising to increase the emotional effect, activity in the amygdala went up. And opposite for decrease, when you when you um, try and decrease and, and reappraise in a way that reduces the negative impact, the activity of the amygdala decreases. And so what we see from this, this supports the idea that the way we think about something can influence emotion, and it does that by influencing the activity in our uh, amygdala. So emotion's not just cognition, and it's not just biology, Right, it can be the interaction of the both, right? One influencing the other to produce the emotion. And that's remember that's exactly what the LO is looking for, the learning outcome. That you're looking at how um, they interact in in other words, how they influence one another. And this example, cognition. Right, here we are. So cognitive reappraisal can affect our emotion. How we think will um, affect our feelings, but the reappraisal does that by the influence of the amygdala. So how it reappraises either gonna jump up the amygdala or decrease the amygdala okay so just to go over amygdala activity biology influences our experience of emotion so we saw that with the SM case study um, if we don't have an amygdala pretty hard to experience fear it's integral in that um, respect and but how we think about things can also affect our experience of emotion through its influence on the amygdala Short answer tips. Now, I don't think this will be a short answer question because I think it's too complex. However, if it is, it would probably look something like this. And so if you are, if this is the question or you, you're asked about how biology and cognition affect the emotion, I would choose the second example I went through, the top-down processing, because you're going to look at cognitive reappraisal or fix the which affects the emotion. That way you're going to get both. The, the cognition and the biology. If you just focus on the amygdala and um, the, the bottom-up processing with the SM case study, there's no real example of uh, cognition in that one. So I think you're going to limit yourself. And so I would use Uri's um, study to support this. Now, if this was an essay question, you know, to what extent do biological cognitive factors in, uh, interact in emotion? I think it's fine to begin with the, uh, just keep it simple, the amygdala activity affects emotion, and essentially in the same order that I explained in this video. Uh, you can look at the animal studies, you know, the, the lesioning of the monkeys and also SM's case study to show that the amygdala is pretty essential in feeling uh, fear. And I would be specific in talking about fear in that example um, because it wasn't looking at a range of other emotions. And actually SM's case study, they found that uh, when they showed her the videos, um, they showed her a series of videos, she could actually feel other emotions like um, happiness and, and, and joy um, and disgust, but not fear, which is pretty interesting. Then I would go into the cognitive reappraisal and make the emotion. So the second example I talked about and Uri et al's um, example. And that would give you enough of them, plus you, you throw in a couple of counter arguments, that would be an amazing essay. So counter arguments, critical thinking. Um, like I said, does this apply to all emotions? You, you've probably only really talked about, or we've only talked about in this example, fear. You know, what about happiness? Um, in the earlier study, they did, the dependent variable wasn't emotion. You know, they just measured the, the amygdala activity. So we're making the assumption that this is going to affect emotion, but in that study alone, they don't measure it. So, you know, how do we know? that, that it's, a, it's not a limitation of the study, but it is something we have to be mindful of. Um, and to what extent? So, you know, SM's case study suggests, do we need cognition at all? Like, bottom-up processing, it can just be biological, unless you go, what about perception? Perceptions of cognitive process is, you know, there needs to be some sort of perception there. So that's another point to consider about, uh, consider. Uh, if you use SM's case study, you can think, well, is this generalizable? This is one person, right? One person who had a, gene uh, who had a genetic condition. So, you know, um, could that, uh, could these results apply uh, to, to, to everyone? And another thing maybe to consider, are they equally important, right? To what extent do they interact? Is that interaction equal or is one more important than the other? Um, and also, have we seen an interaction? So interaction is, influence means one influences the other. Interaction means it's bi-directional. Biology affects cognition, cognition affects biology. So have we really seen a bi-directional interaction here, or have we just seen an influence? And so um, to sort of elaborate on that point, another interesting result from early study was that they found a negative correlation between the VMPFC, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, and amygdala activation. Um, now, this is really extra for experts here, so don't don't worry if I, if I lose you with this one. But what they found was that the more the, the VMPFC, this part of the brain in here, uh, the higher the activity that was, then the lower the amygdala activation. So actually, that 
the, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex has an important function in cognitive reappraisal. So here we see, again, there's more biology involved. You know, it's not just a cognition. Something has to be powering that cognition to then have the effect on um, the amygdala. And this is a good example, I think, for localization of function. Um, we'll get to that in a second. So there's a lot to go here, a lot to go over. And so if you're really studying this example in depth, it, it makes sense to try and use it in other learning outcomes. Um, and I wouldn't be, don't be put off, this learning outcome is complex. And if it comes up in the exam and if you've studied well, you're well prepared, I, I think you should be happy because, you know, if you're using the examples I've explained in this video, you've got a real potential to, to separate your answer from the rest. I think a lot of people would be using um, Schachter and Singer's two-factor theory. And while that can be done, it can be done well, uh, it is pretty tricky, it's pretty complicated, and it, it tends not to be done so well. And especially because the study is really hard to explain. But I use Schachter and Singer's um, example for years, and it's fine if you're, if you're also using that. Um, so what other learning outcomes can we use? We can use localization of function. The case in the amygdala, ability to feel fear, or we could use the VMPFC and cognitive reappraisal. Um, and also, I think the function to talk about there would be the ventromedial prefrontal cortex's role in um, uh, down influ or influencing top-down processing of the amygdala. I think that's what it's showing, that that part of the brain is affecting the amygdala. That would be the function I would talk about. Um, there's a learning outcome in the biological level of analysis about uh, the interaction of cognition and physiology and behavior. If your behavior is emotion, you can, it's, it's essentially the exact same example we've just talked about. Um, you can talk about brain imaging, so fMRI, an early study, uh, and how that was used, and also MRI um, S, uh, for SM. You know, they would need to use the MRI to locate uh, the damage and to see that she had that isolated damage. And every study also shows the role of cognition in technology. What's interesting about this one, it shows how technology can influence um, biology and brain activity, and that's why they use the, the fMRI. Uh, so, um, yeah, you can use that for those two. Uh, if you're doing abnormal psychology and if you've studied PTSD, um, you can also use this to look at the role of um, uh, etiologies. So uh, cognitive reappraisal, um, there tends to be uh, low activity and low volume of the ventromedial prefrontal cortex in people with PTSD, that's a common finding, and that could explain their increased um, emotional arousal. So uh, they also have a hyperactive amygdala, typically speaking. So you know, if you've got a hyperactive amygdala, you've got these high levels of emotion, but you've got a low VMPFC, low function, low volume, you, that might affect your ability to, to reappraise stimuli, to think differently, and to reduce that activity in the amygdala, to reduce your anxiety, which could explain the symptoms of heightened arousal and heightened anxiety that we see in people with PTSD. So that's another way you can use this as well. Um, so there's a lot to go through there, but I do hope that was helpful. I think this is a tricky learning outcome, so the, the key is to break it down. How biology affects emotion and how cognition affects emotion. Uh, and yeah, just take your time planning and thinking about that. All right, good luck.